you know what we're doing around here. <laughs> yeah, right, we're good. Totally do. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Lore Beards. We have ourselves a super special guest. Yes, we do. Hello. <laughs> Alrighty, so we don't have Gav for the longest amount of time today, so I'm going to quickly dive straight in with a quick intro, because I do love a quick intro, and you you know what I'm like, I do like to garble on about things, I'm going to try and make it super short though, give everybody enough time to gather in, we'll like, filter a few words in your direction by discussing myself. <laughs> One of my favorite subjects. So this is going to sound a little bit weird, but a long time ago, back when I was 18 years old, I got myself an interview for Games Workshop. Now, this was a really long time ago. And uh, I got uh, an interview, cut my hair because my hair was down to my waist and I cut it down super short. And I went to the local shop to me, which was the Aberdeen store, which was recently opened at the very north of Scotland. I had an interview and they couldn't believe that I ran my own club, that I had over 20 to 50,000 points of every single army. I had every single Games Workshop game. Indeed, they were so stunned, they invited me down to the uh, head office the very next month to have a second interview. I thought I'd flubbed the first one. Um, and that they were giving me a second one to give me a second <laughs> chance. So I went swimming all the way down to Nottingham. And um, I had myself uh, an interview which was more along the lines of, are you real? Do you exist? Who the hell are you? And what? Um, that was pretty much my interview. Um, and I gave them a gift of a full-size Space Marine helmet, which sat inside the head of retail's office for over three years because my mum had made it. <laughs> um, and it, it was Azrael's helmet. Good old, that's why I've got my Dark Angel hat on today. Um, and because my mom had made it, um, I was then invited to stay inside head office for a week where I sat around, I uh, sat in troll, uh, the mail order trolls for a day. I was in sales for two days. I went over to the studio for a day. I was put up in company house with a chap called Sven Meister who was doing Scandinavian Sven. translation. <laughs> oh, you know, Sven, there you go. I, I I have no idea why I remember this guy, but I do. I, I do know why I remember because he poured orange juice on his muesli, and I thought that was weird. Um, so there I was uh, <laughs> doing my games workshopy thing, and they said, dude, you can work anywhere you want. Where do you want to work? And I chose to work as close to my parents as I could because I was only 18. I was a kid. And they said, are you sure? I mean, you could work anywhere. You could, I mean, you could go apprentice down at the studio. You could go um, sit in sales because you're so good at it. You've been on the phone for two days and we've really enjoyed that. You could pop up. Really? And they said, yes, well, we're not going to put you in the Aberdeen store because nobody goes there and that's stupid. <laughs> so we're going to pop you in the Edinburgh store because that's um, at the moment pretty much the biggest store in the company other than the superstore that was London. So we'll pop you there. Job be done. And that was how I started in Games Workshop. Not long after that, an article popped up in uh, White Dwarf saying a bunch of new apprentices had just arrived in the studio. Um, and one of these new apprentices was Mr. Gav Thorpe. Now, um, I'm not sure apprentice is quite the right term. I can't remember exactly how they popped up in White Dwarf, but it was something like that. And I remember going, huh, that could have been me. I mean, <laughs> that could have been me. This is super interesting. And I have had this bizarre one-sided connection to Gav pretty much ever since that day. In my head, 100% mental, on my side only, where I've always wondered, whatever Gav is doing, that could have been me doing that. That could have been me doing those things. I wouldn't change a thing. And I adore Gav's career because of this. And if you don't know already, Gav has written just about every single bloody Warhammer book that exists. And he is the best. Not only has he written some of the coolest bits out there, he is also, as it happens, one of the nicest people in the world. I met him when we were going to be organizing a big campaign book for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. It's a book that sadly didn't come to pass, but I still intend to run that bloody game because it was going to be a fucking awesome campaign. And yes, I did indeed yeah. swear because it bloody deserved it. So um, <laughs> if you do watch over on the Lawhammer channels in around about half a year to a year's time, you'll probably see something <laughs> what Gav and I wrote being yeah. played out in front of you. Genuinely With all of that, for that. <laughs> hey Gav, it's great to have you here. Hello. I'm done. I imagine every other question is going to come from Sotek. I'm going to sit back and enjoy the show. <laughs> you, do, you do realize with that story you've told, which I you have mentioned before, but it's great is that if you had taken that one of those jobs, I wouldn't be here. Oh, you're kidding me. I, 
I came late to it. So basically, they advertised the three positions. Assistant games developer was the position. And they advertised mm. the three positions in White Dwarf. And I looked at it. And much like you, I mean, I was 19 at the time, or maybe even 18 when the, the ad went out or something like that. And it said, oh, you know, new position in design studio, graduate, you know, in English, preferably, blah, 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 which I wasn't. So I didn't I didn't apply to that. And it was only, it was only kind of like chance that I ended up applying to the studio later just for when I was sending stuff to Jervis to look at after encountering games day and they'd actually hired three people originally and two of them dropped out in between interview and being off the job one to become a legal clerk and one it turned out ended up being a i've talked to him a little while back a few years back um uh, ended up being a, a uh he got engaged i think so he was going to move in with his fiance or something and i'm not sure which one i talked to, but ended up being a manager of a carpet uh warehouse <laughs> um so i was on the bad dice co- podcast years ago and he, and he, he messaged me afterwards but if you had taken up one of those posts they would have been because i was so then so there's one of the original stayed and then mark hawkins i think it was took the second place and i ended up taking the third so if that third place hadn't been there huh. i wouldn't have got a job that's a thing. you literally would have been doing the things that well maybe not literally but you know so, <laughs> yeah. so thanks actually thanks for for uh braving um edinburgh retail for me <laughs> <It was, laughs> i appreciate it it was certainly a choice <laughs> i was a kid i mean obviously well, not, i came to do writing stuff later um my uh, well, uh well, so on the flip side i got turned down for retail twice for games workshop so <laughs> if, I, if i hadn't been wanting to go to the studio which they obviously kind of got the the vibe off me of me like having written loads of stuff and saying it'd be great to work in the studio as opposed to i want to become an area manager for a retail chain mm. which, who says that when they're 17. um yeah totally um so i didn't get a job going that direction really um so you know, you know i could have ended up you know moving to the edinburgh being moved to the edinburgh store or taking up your position and forcing <laughs> who knows? The studio. so <laughs> as a flip on the carpet side as well but my my abiding memory of going down to Tewton street for the first time was having a nice taxi coming from the train station all the way up to where everything happened in games workshop i was beyond excited i just turned 18 and i was driving along and i looked over and i saw sterling carpets and i went oh, what yes. the fuck? yeah yeah Sterling, Sterling carpet. carpet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, the corner. Yeah, yeah. Sterling carpets, and I sat there looking at it for some time, and then slowly but surely, lots of names that I recognised started popping up as shop titles around me, and I was like, "Oh, those unoriginal bar stewards!" <laughs> and then just lift the names and drop them. And I, I picked this up with Graham Davis sometime later, um, and I said, "Was this something you did?" And he's like, "Yeah, totally." We'd often be in the pub, and we'd just look outside, and we'd say, "That'll do," um, and write it down. And I was like, "There you go." That was a fun one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sterling Carpets. You heard it there. Maybe 100th time. You ever wonder if any of those companies yeah. like end up getting into the hobby and suddenly see that? They're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Well, they, yeah. I'm, I'm going to bring up a comment which I think is pertinent from my wife. If Andy hadn't taken a job in Nottingham, I wouldn't have met him. So I'm glad it worked out this way. I think we need a sliding doors reboot <laughs> with Kevin Andy. Yeah, that would be cool. I do call it a sliding doors moment. It is one of those ying, yeah, oh. you know, like completely different life could have, could have happened. Yeah, so I, I, I would spoken to Jervis or you know. Yeah. In retrospect, it all seems to fit together, but it's, things are so fragile at any particular point all the way along. Um, it's a so we always go, oh, it was destined to be a fate. Like, no, coincidence and serendipity are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so, very glad it worked out the way it did because sorry, for, yes, uh, yeah, someone thinking. in my position, it worked out very, very nicely because I got to enjoy all the crazy nonsense y'all have made over the years. <laughs> And we're all here together today, so it worked uh, out beautifully. Okay, so so here's a quick sorry, I'm, we're gonna hijack this. But sorry, Andy. So <laughs> right. <laughs> so the Tau were based on a, a, a like a, a concept, not a very original one, but a concept I had when I was about 16 for an alien race based on the, the four elements plus another one psychic. So we end up with the cast and the ethereal. Like, yeah, yeah. So what alien race or race did you have in your head at 16 that you were going to invent for Warhammer that would have happened instead? <laughs> 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 oh, 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 no, 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 don't start me on this. I was I was absolutely obsessed with the gene stealers at the time and I had spun up <laughs> an entirely different background. We do not need to go into this. Because <laughs> I was obsessed. <laughs> oh, oh, that, man, so in another that's for a different <laughs> yeah, we, we need so, there is a universe somewhere where <laughs> oh yeah um i i yeah uh, oh wow i hadn't thought about that for years i wrote an entire short story about them 
A whole short story. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I did. Oh, oh, I oh 16, I suppose, actually. That's pretty good. Yeah, I, I wrote yeah. stats for them for 40k. Uh, oh, man. Oh, I'd forgotten about that completely. Anyway, that's not what we're here for today. Um, I'm <laughs> going to pass over to good old Lord Master because if I don't, I'm no, just going to be reminiscing all day. I like, it's not, I'm, 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 it's he's, do, he's, doing, he's doing too many podcasts, is it? So we can't, yeah, another, right. we can't have another spin off one of yeah. just like Andy and Gav talk about what would have happened. Uh, hey, listen, I would watch it though. Like, that's the thing, is that <laughs> I, I would tune in to see. Yeah, me too. Oh, I, I'm just going to sit here and reminisce with that crap story. <laughs> Um, it was written with a fountain pen. It was written with a fountain pen because it oh. made it special. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, because you couldn't find a goose feather. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm gonna cry. It was my special writing pen. <laughs> it's still in a, is it still in a wax envelope somewhere? <laughs> oh no, no, I broke it when I moved down to Edinburgh. I, I literally sat. <laughs> I ended up with a big blue bomb because I sat on my fountain pen. I was gutted that day. I suppose that was a metaphor for the decisions I made. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, right. So I'm, I'm very aware that uh, good old Sotek has a host of questions that he'd like to bring up and ask Gav. We've also had a variety of questions posted over on Sotek's Discord. And um, we're probably going to have to have a good rattle through those given that we've... Um, uh, already had a good 12 minutes worth of reminiscing about Tau creation yes, and yeah. bizarre cults. No, no, don't be sorry. This is half the fun. Um, yeah. So I'm going to pass over to good old Sotek and say, right. what? Given you now have you have the opportunity, you have the gav, <laughs> yeah, the gav sitting right in front of you. What burning question has been sitting in your mind for the last <laughs> five years that now you've got an opportunity to do it? I can sit back and just generally snigger as gav goes i don't know i wrote that 10 years ago shit i was gonna say i was gonna say 15 years last 25 years i was gonna say well 16 17 years ago was when i went when i left games workshop was when i went freelance so anything that was actually in an official like army book or whatever was more than 17 years ago Wow, the time really has flown. Uh, yeah, I, I was shocked the other day when I realised just how long it's been since there's been an official Warhammer game, and I went, "Ah, oh, crap." <laughs> I was just thinking, actually, date-wise, yeah, it was almost so just over because I started on the first <clears> of November, first of November, uh, thirty years ago. Thirty thirty years ago. Okay, so yeah. um, oh. that would be right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty much perfect. Just kind of my age, yeah. But so yeah, so almost, almost, so like in two weeks' time, roughly. Yes, and I am. I am my thirtieth anniversary of starting against. I am against thirty-one years old. For anyone curious. <laughs> oh, great! Thanks. Oh, I'm gonna get I'm some diet. I was gonna say, I'm just gonna go and get just for men. Anyway, it's a bit late for that. Just for old men. Hey, I've had a whole oh. lifetime to grow up with the stuff, and it is. It's been. It's been a gift. It really has. Truly. <laughs> Sorry, I let you go. Then. Go. Yeah. Right. Yes. Go. Cool. <laughs> well, okay. So there, there are lots of potential places to start. Um, but I, I think kind of the the best place that I would like to start, uh, just kind of like looking uh, at my uh, all the books and stuff, is uh, I think one of the things that's always kind of really uh, been important to me, especially when comparing like Warhammer to other universes, um, is how in Warhammer it managed to take concepts of like dwarfs and elves. Um, of which you've written some of like genuinely the best books between like the Sundering series and then um, uh, the the book about King Berendin Stoneheart of the the Dwarfs of Zavvar, which is such a freaking it is like the best dwarf book, Black <laughs> Library book ever written. It is it does such a good job exploring them without like having to focus too much on a human perspective and stuff. But um, of the idea of how how were you how did you approach dealing with dwarves and elves which are such a stereotypical fantasy set of races and evolve them into something genuinely new instead of what they kind of end up being in every other universe which is usually just Tolkien plus um or or something or just or just humans with pointy ears or humans that are short yeah um so i, I think the thing with warhammer although it borrows uh, liberally from everywhere the point is it borrows liberally from everywhere and that's the difference, rather than just borrowing liberally from one or two places. So, and actually, and, and very much, particularly with the writers of that time as well, it's very much, because it's this blend of fantasy and history, it takes very fantastical 
mythical elements, particularly like Tolkienesque elements like the elves and stuff, and grounds them quite a lot and turns them into a real thing. There, there isn't any, although there's a sort of like the magical quality to the elves of Warhammer, and there's you know the dwarves have their runes and things. They're, they're, they're actually quite grounded in historical cultures or, or real world people. So the dwarves, you know, are Yorkshire miners. You know, they're they're they yeah. the archetypes is this fantasy archetype, but then taken from well, what what would be the contemporary or that time particularly in the 80s what would be the contemporary equivalent of these like these the north myth of the dwarfs and these art you know stuff and it's actually these gruff grudge bearing gnarly miners um and so that element like really um brings brings that idea into the real world into the world that we can understand and same with similarly with the 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 elves you know again because they're a blend of Different elven archetypes, and and some of them very different from from the Tolkienesque elves and Melibonians, and but also uh, it was always important to go back to the things that inspired the people that wrote those fantasies in the first place. So, you know, again with the dwarfs or the elves, it's not just Tolkien, but actually what was Tolkien inspired about? Going back to the Anglo-Saxon, going back to that those traditions that he was inspired by, and and looking at what was there and bringing. So so. Um, so in the same way today, if if en, you know stuff ends up being a copy of a copy, actually what Warhammer kind of sidestepped, particularly as it developed, because again, let's be honest, it's had a long time to gain that depth yeah. and those influences as well. And it, and and when it started, some of it wasn't quite so sophisticated. It was just it's a concept from here. <laughs> um, but but and and actually, you know, uh, let's just um, you know we'll just put this in our universe and we will make some models of it. Um, but I think, yeah, make that reality of it in terms of uh, the, the 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 archetypes they're drawing on, not just being fantasy, not just being fictional archetypes, but being historical archetypes as well. So, um, so again, as we as we developed, you know, when Bill was writing up the high elves, and as we kind of looked at what was developing there, this idea of um, they're very they're very much based on kind of like. Uh, a bit like uh, it's more like classical Greece in terms of these city states and the, mm. the controlling the areas around, and particularly these two big powers of Calidor and the other one I can't remember, Anarian. Um, and he's thinking, and so again, it's like a bit like the spark, not literally, again, don't be too literal about these, but this idea of these these two hegemonies basically influencing the rest mm. of the and the politics are based from there. Um, uh, and, and again, you know, going over to the dwarves, you know these isolated pockets of the dwarves where essentially they're very local you know a colliery is the center for the uh you know for the culture of that area and so although there's this commonality across all miners from like south of wales to scotland actually you know the fact that you're at this colliery or that colliery is your you know and you've got your own brass band and you've got and, and that's very identity <laughs> so you've kind of got this this cultural link but actually again the dwarves have that so about uh, it's about being a dwarf, but actually, probably first and foremost, it's about being from this particular hold or being dwarfs of this particular place. So it, it it takes broad archetypes and makes them quite specific, but then actually gives them again the the big benefit of the old world was it gave them a very specific geography as well, and and, mm -hmm. and also again those two in particular uh, uh, were were bedded into the history of Warhammer in a really interesting way. In that even before humans came along. Which you know is a little bit talking this, but actually, you know, the dwarves and the, and the elves had this big colonial war. You know, the elves came into the old world uh, and set up all these castles and started building cities and stuff, and then they run into the dwarves. And and Rick particularly was always very keen to say, despite you know, it was like all oh, the dark elves died. He said, no, the point being actually, it was inevitable that they would clash. That these two cultures mm. would not be able to coexist. They, they were so different in temperament. They were so different in ambition. You know um, that they, at some point they would end up having a fight, and the catalyst might have been an attack by you know these so-called dark elves. The dark elves didn't recognise as being bad guys for some reason, despite being wearing big purple pointy hats <laughs> and bl blades. Um, you know, all, all elves look the same to a dwarf. You know, um, so you know, and, and again, so all of this thing actually is bedded into the history of the Warhammer world and that deep history of the Warhammer world before before even we get to. 1700 years of the 2700 years of the empire so if if it just feels like they've you know they're just part of it in a way that the mountains are a part of it or the rivers or the maps so, uh, and that, and that gives them a reality i think that you don't necessarily get in certain other settings but it's taken time to do that so mm -hmm. oh that's all <clears throat> hey i <laughs> love the amount of like historical back text to that cuz that's something that is like a very heavily debated topic among modern warhammer fans 
is you often get these ideas of like what inspired the things that led to what we have now, which is really funny to watch a lot of those discussions and then get to actually talk to the people that wrote them. And it's usually a lot less complicated than the conspiracy theories tend to be. <laughs> about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, there are different writers inspired by different things. So again, that's the thing is like, again, uh when when you know fancy role plays being first written or you know when rick and uh, that were sort of like doing third edition well particularly third to fourth edition warhammer was when the old world you know and fancy role play were really firming up into the worlds that we know that, or know them as they became you know like I say yeah that they you know th these guys were you know mostly historians archaeologists people that are like military mm -hmm. historians that's the stuff they liked and and they were also just reading like you know obviously fantasy and sci-fi from the 50s 60s 70s and uh, into the 80s you know so they were that was all their influences but then come along you know i'm of a slightly later generation uh and stuff so my influences are slightly different and then the people that came after me are slightly different so all of these cultural touchstones that people will use or the archetypes that they build on add something and, and f if if it's done well then it just sort of like adds layers and adds texture to those worlds um but and sometimes we got it wrong we just like we we kind of crowbarred in some fairly crude jokes and references and stuff as well, <laughs> which didn't you know but that's the thing that that humor there as well again you know yeah well that, that has been one of the had to be part of it yeah that that is one of the advantages though i think to that kind of evolving narrative is that warhammer especially fantasy in particular has been surprisingly good at every time it kind of goes through a new evolution if there are parts that are kind of unnecessary or maybe <laughs> maybe even a little hard uh, back then like it kind of sheds those off and replaces them with something a little more that fits in a little more seamlessly. Um, and it's been really interesting in particular watching that in more recent times, like when Warmer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition started, which both of you obviously worked on to a fair bit, it kind of took on the Herculean task of trying to take everything that was Warhammer ah! Fantasy and <laughs> slowly, <laughs> slowly, <laughs> slowly start to I just gonna have to get lie down. I'm just thinking about it. I think. <laughs> Which, it, like, right. I, 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 I've told Andy this, I will never forget when it, the first book came out, um, and I initially read it, I was like, what is this? I have, like, because I had grown up with, like, 6th edition fantasy up through 8th edition into the end times and such, so for me, uh, when the first book came out, and it was the old version of the Empire initially, like, the old map with the different provinces and stuff, I looked at it and I was like, this isn't my Empire, what is this garbage? <laughs> Who did this? Hashtag uh, not my empire. Yeah, only yeah. to uh, <laughs> learn later that is just an older form of it. And then the role play, which took directly from uh, the plans that y'all had developed, uh, was instead this evolving of it evolved into the things that I knew and understand. But it took all of these old things and started binding them together to tell an overall story that there was sure a lot of like retcons and stuff to try and make everything work. But it was retconning things as little as possible to make things work and it's so exciting to just watch all of these different things from all these different authors being kind of just you know jigsawed a little bit so that they fit together um to really create something really really special that continues to make me not only more excited for the universe and whole uh, in general but like even more excited for the old world which is going to do its own like little sawing off at pieces to try and jigsaw everything together yeah yeah big well yeah big, big jigsaw <laughs> But um, yeah. uh, I don't know where I was going with that. I don't know why I got off on that tangent. Anyway, back to my actual questions. Of, um, That's right. One of the things that uh, I particularly love in this book, and I think for people that are role-playing, uh, whether in Warhammer Fantasy or doing their own writing and stuff, is would you have any advice as far as when it comes to, I guess we'll start with dwarves just because we were talking about them a little bit more. When it comes to understanding a dwarf, playing a dwarf, writing for a dwarf, what really separates them in your mind from being human like how do you go how do you approach a dwarf without just being a man that happens to be that height and particularly wide <laughs> yeah i think so uh, there's a few things i suppose that uh and, and i tried to you know when, when i was writing the dwarf novels and, and just you know, writing about dwarfs in general was try to to bed in so the first thing is their longevity so although they're not they're not immortal or anything like that you know they live for several hundred years um and for most of that time they're actually already a grumpy old man <laughs> um so, you know beardlings are, uh you know uh if somebody mentioned beardlings in the chat you know beardlings are 40 year old and under you know um so 
once by the time uh, dwarfs come of age, they're essentially already middle aged, um, and mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, Again, I, I quote Rick on this. So basically, you know, once you get to a certain age, there's certain things, particularly a man uh, of a of a certain generation would like, which is a shed and somewhere to just to tinker with and to not be bothered, left on his own. And that's basically a dwarf. A dwarf just wants to just be left on his own, but of course the world won't leave them alone. Um, you know, people keep attacking them, people keep wanting the things they dig up and all the rest of it. Um, and and then you have to put up with this for basically hundreds of years. People just basically they are the get off my lawn generation for their entire <laughs> life um and so so you have this mindset of everything in the world is slightly annoying everything in the world keeps changing and that's really annoying because of course again dwarfs i've fl flipped this slightly because always again not necessarily about elves particularly but it's slightly so uh, but when i talk about elder and elves a little bit they're supposed to have these heightened emotion stuff so i always compare them to teenagers because everything they're very mm. faddish they're into everything everything everything's the best thing or the worst thing ever and all the rest of it stuff so you've got to remember so so the opposite to that is dwarves who are like i say just really grumpy old men who hate anything that changes and want to basically have roast beef every day and and it not and, and basically to go on forever like that and not have to and they could just do their thing and just be themselves and so and that as a culture, again, I, I say old men, not in a sexist way, but just like as in a cultural, the women are like that as well. Generally, uh, culturally, they just want you to not talk to them um, because their program's on um, or whatever it might be. So, <laughs> um, uh, and that invests every part of their culture. Uh, so they're, they're very, so, and then again, because we're talking about uh, a, a different you know, sort of like culture and species, you then turn that up, you exaggerate that. So it's not just about being grumpy, but it's about bearing grudges. They remember every slight ever about what your Uncle Kevin said about you at that wedding 20, 200 years ago, you know, and until, and they still never said sorry. Yeah. Mm. Um, and the and the, and the gossip and everything else that builds out into this kind of like, and, and there's kind of like, um, there's like it's nice lyrical qualities to it as well because you know it's like they mine these different strata of 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 the world and do do deeper but their their culture and their lives build up the strata of all of these grudges and and relationships and stuff and it makes them and that, and they again they have this tendency to become more insular and more annoyed by all of this stuff um, mm. rather than rather than rather than growing just to you know be a bit more world weary it's like no it just gets them you know they're always in a slight of almost kind of irritated rage <laughs> at the best of times. Mm. Um, about stuff, and then you have to remember that they actually absolutely love gold, gold, and, and in a way that is, like I say, almost genetic. It's the the gold has an effect on it. There's a reason they have like you know, three hundred plus words and keep inventing them for different types of gold because the gold fever again isn't just like they're not just they're not greedy, although they are, but then they're, they're not mm -hmm. you know they're not just hoarding. That's why they fight with dragons because you know dragons and dwarfs both like to hoard, um, and and they both like to just well in, in the same kind of places but but they yes they they have a genuine again like the prospect uh, you know the gold literally the gold fever gold rush kind of thing they have that but again all the time you know uh the the if you think about you know my precious my my thing you know dwarves have that and so they're constantly fighting up against their own character their own nature that to 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 essentially live with each other and share and and so they they have to build up this they built this society of traditions and rules and hierarchy and structure that allow allow them just to actually get on and uh and and lots of big rules books that they can refer to so nobody has to make a decision anymore and then like exactly they know exactly how somebody's annoyed them and why mm. um mm. and so yeah so that's and that's the character of the dwarf really so you get your head into that space uh, which has got easier as i've got older um <laughs> get but, off my lawn, Gav. Yeah, get off my but but um and, and you start from that place of like yeah basically of this kind of slightly there's this very irritated paranoid miner who you know everyone's out to you know they everyone's out to jump your claim, everyone's out to get your thing. Um but who has to deal with the world because the world is actually other dwarfs and things and again, you know, now and again apparently, you know you have to eat and you have to do all these other things. So you, you tolerate the world. Dwarves are basically the race that tolerates the rest of the world existing. Um, and then, and then, and then you just ask questions of that, you know, like, well, how would that mean? How would they deal with this? If this happened, how would they deal with that? How do you know, how would marriage be? You know, again, we've got, it's, it's gone into it and stuff. The idea that, you know, there's, there's 10, uh, 
uh, there's 10 male dwarfs for each female dwarf or, or whatever it might be. And so and you go, well, that's OK. But the thing is, dwarfs are very low libido, genuinely, because, again, they're just little mm, old men in their mm. shed. They don't really think about it. They like tinkering with things and stuff, because it has to be, because otherwise they'd just be killing each other over mating rights or whatever. Do you know what I mean? It, it wouldn't, that society wouldn't work. So actually, and which is why they're very circumspect about reproduction and family, but they're very, but family is very important to them and, and ancestors and all the rest of it. So you have, again, you have these two, two things that blend together to make something of like family is really important, but actually the act of creating family is something that's just like a necessity. It's very British, mm. Victorian, you know, well, I'll lie back and think of the hold um, or, or whatever it might be. Um, <laughs> And so, so again, you have this very slowly, you know, uh, sort of like um, a generational process as well. Because there's other things they don't like young people being around. And if you make young people yourself, there's more of them. And then you have to, you know. Um, so, and 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 so, and, and then and then again, you exaggerate. So the beardlings and the rebellious guys, and all the, but occasionally they just go mad as well. That's the other thing, in, you know. In the same way that rich people are allowed to get eccentric. Uh, you know, you, hmm. get the crazy, you get the engineer who just invented, you know, you get the, the you know, um, what's his name, Mad McKyson and all these other crazy engineers who get thrown out of the unions and the guilds and stuff for having ideas and want to do stuff differently. But they're all, but again, but in that same way of like, oh, he's a bit eccentric, there's just a little bit of the dwarfs are still, because that, that, they don't like stone them to death or do anything horrible to them. They just like, you know, just don't talk to them a bit or they, you know, it's like, it's enough that they've had that, you know, they've taken off their, you know, their, their badge. You go, well, it's not a member of our club anymore. <laughs> it's exactly the same. It's just it's not a member of oh. our club anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my favourite, the when we did Grudge Law, and I co-wrote that with Nick Davis, uh, not Nick Davis, Nick Kine, Nick Kine, which was one of my favouritest projects ever because I do. Really hey, like I did some work for that too. Woo. Yes, yeah. you did. <laughs> this book did. is. Uh, this book is. I don't know if you can see how yes. worn this thing is because <laughs> yeah. of how I've abused it over the years. It's um the Black yeah. Library background book, the, Grudge Lore. Yeah, the big one. Yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of the pages are shrunk down and put into the back of that. Um, oh, were they? I didn't but, know that. Yeah, yes. yeah, Grudge Lore. Yeah. It's even it's even like a different. You probably can't tell, but it's like a different color. It's this dark oh, yeah, gray. So this is Grudge Lore, yeah. and then this is the actual novels. Which I'm cool. still picking up a copy of that to see if they transferred any of my stuff. Uh, I think they probably did. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and, and that was great uh, because, but one of my favourite bits in there is uh, I can't remember exactly what the context was, but the idea that a king, one of the kings, got a bit greedy and decided to introduce a tax on beer, which of course is a you know, tax on alcohol, <laughs> fairly natural. Yeah. And, and, and basically, all the dwarfs just stopped. Doing everything. It was just like the general strike of doom. I've just literally they just down tools and went and sat in the king's audience chamber and just sat there and looked at it. Uh, and everything had gone so quiet because the dwarfs, again, you know, there's this constant ringing and digging mm -hmm. and stuff. And they're very sensitive to the noise and stuff. You know, again, I think it's at the, it's at the start of, it might be the start of Doom of Dragon Back. I can't remember where, where essentially they're, are they yeah. using, they use different calls. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Described as the, uh, a high pitched note followed by a low pitched note. Yeah, which sort of may go slightly high. Oh. Um, <laughs> which echoes <laughs> down. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, I wish we didn't know that. I wish um, we didn't know that. <laughs> I, maybe shouldn't have said that. But oh, which, echoes, which is like an echo location <laughs> down into. Um, down in, and, they can kind of, and, and then they call back and they can and they can locate each other by the echoes and stuff. They know the know the tunnels all that well. Um, sorry, where did I start with that? Um, what was the point? Back before, to where you go. Yeah, uh, I think I got it. Strike. Yeah, oh, yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. I said this. So suddenly that hole's gone quiet. Literally, nobody's digging, tinkering, hitting handvils, doing any of this stuff. And the silence basically is just too much for the king. He's like, I think it's half a day or a day. Just gives in. It's like, fine, fine. I won't tax beer in. And they all just go back to work again. Um, and so, um, and, I, and that's just, you know, again, it's like, don't mess with my, you know, you, you can do this, you can do that, but you don't mess with my beer. Um, mm -hmm. Again, so that idea that, again, we just come around these days, you know, craft ale is a big thing and stuff like that. But again, in the 70s and 80s, like homebrew was a thing, you know, home, you know, mm -hmm. um, and and so the dwarfs and, and and very small breweries, micro breweries are getting very popular now. But um, the, the idea, but the dwarfs are getting into that sort of thing of like, and oh yes, here's this you know this keg of beer that that again that culture 
of um, you know drinking warm beer in the summer and stuff and you know, like it's there's only been like 10 barrels of this one made and it's because it's very particular thing that actually each one's got a troll's head in it to give it a particular flavor or whatever um mm. uh, so yeah so all of that but, but but very simply grumpy old men who want to be left alone um is a good starting point yeah well and so much of that it's it's so uh fascinating to hear a lot of that and then kind of be tying it back to like particular moments that i really enjoy from the various books and stories and stuff and how that applies so well like um in in your book one of the um one of the parts that i love so much that i think does a, such a good job of exploring dwarfs uh is when uh in grudge bear when Barrington meets the like the nephew of the human lord and the human lord yes. is like back you know he's a descendant who's backstabbed the dwarves and he's like a horrible person and uh they're all coming in to fight and stuff and then the nephew rides up to king Barrington and he's like yeah so i'm i killed my uncle because he was a bastard and here's all your dwarf gold how about we don't fight you spare my people and we consider things and Barrington's like all the dwarves are just like Oh, what like their heads nearly explode because like morally from a human perspective he did the right thing and that he killed his uncle who was a terrible person and saved a lot of lives but the doors are like you killed your kin but for a good reason and the doors are just set like have, they have to take a minute to try yeah. and rationalize what just happened so quick consult the books what does it yeah. what do the books say about this yeah and it's like it's such a good scene of the doors take it takes them a bit to decide whether or not they should see him as an ally or an enemy because of what he just did, um, yes. which is, which is so, it's so fantastic. Um, but I also love that description of that. You can also see very well that kind of natural doors and elves never would have worked out of this sense of you have this very, very emotional culture. that's all about like reaching the heights of sensation and, not try, trying not to fall into boredom and all these other things that come with their issues, which are completely the opposite of the dwarf outlook on life. Uh, and like, it's, it's honestly shocking. They got along for as, as well as they did for as long as they did, which was probably more just due to trade and how beneficial it was for them more than anything yes. else. Yes. And, 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 and very different concepts of honor. So for, mm. for, for an elf, honor is almost synonymous with glory, really, and reputation, but not real honor. They're actually quite, you know, they're very political and things. And so obviously you know, their word is important, but, you know, expediency would come in. Whereas for a dwarf, honor and word is literally binding. We, we, we'd carved it in stone. It's like, it can't be changed. And so, you mm. know, so again, if a dwarf gives you his word, he's giving you his word, which an elf just wouldn't, again, for that point, just wouldn't understand. It's like, but... But that was before. It's, you know, it's like, but but we wrote that three hundred years ago when orcs were all over the place. Now that surely circumstances have changed. Maybe we should update the rules. What? No, <laughs> you broke the rules, smack. You know, um, mm. I can't think of any kind of modern stuff that might think like that. But yeah, you know. Um, so that, yeah, that that again, that hidebound nature of the dwarves. Again, it's not all. It's not all just beer and curry. There's like, you know, there there there's there is a darker side to them of not. Um, you know, being being just entrenched and reactionary, and you know that kind of thing as well. So, you you know, as much as it's never trust an elf, it's like never bargain with a dwarf, um, mm. you know, because it's like there's always going to be a devil's deal. They, they'll they'll deal honestly with you, but they'll get the best deal they can, and they'll wring everything they can out of you, and there will be no takesy backsy. You know, it's like it doesn't it doesn't matter what you know. It's like well, I would say. I want to say there's a really funny note in the the starting guide to Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Fourth Edition for Ubersrike, which is something like when the dwarfs agreed to build the walls at Ubersrike, they gave like the humans agreed to a really weird measurement system, which was that it was like going to be like ten dwarfs tall or something, and the dwarf king tried to use like a dwarf infant as the measurement because <laughs> they didn't specify what kind of dwarf so he uses like a really short small dwarf and the humans are like no 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 like an actual dwarf and it causes a huge thing that was super funny because uh, yeah absolutely technically that's what the word said <laughs> they are rules lawyers you know when it comes down to it it doesn't say i can't Weird. it didn't you know <laughs> um <laughs> oh, you know, well, it's not our fault if we didn't, because we've got three hundred books about you know wall specifications back home, which do the the you know the builders guild use, and that's their rules and the blah blah blah. But you're humans, you don't care, you know. It's like to be and to be fair, a dwarf would actually say a wall built ten dwarf babies high is better than a human built wall ten adult dwarfs high. So you know, 
you get mm. the bargain pride, away. Pride in that wall. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So now kind of flipping the question to the Elven side of things, um, we kind of touched on a little bit, but uh, just to get kind of more of an in-depth focus on, because the Sundering series is so, it's beyond fantastic of like each book, does such a good job of i i really wish they made more books like these nowadays where like <laughs> each book literally just tackles a different special character and gives like such awesome insights behind malekith and then a lithanar and then uh Paldor the first um but um when looking at elves for people that are wanting to try and understand the elves of warhammer fantasy whether they're role-playing as an elf or they are doing their own writing or fan fiction or whatever what would be kind of your go-to guide as far as these are the things you should be thinking about and considering when looking at the elves of Warhammer Fantasy? Yeah, so again, the elves come from a similar position of... <laughs> um, <laughs> of being long-lived, even longer than dwarves. But, uh, but actually, but at the same time, getting very bored in that long life. You know, They can spend a lifetime studying and become experts of things and then, and, but then it's like, well, once you've become an expert at a thing, well, I need to study something else. And I need to, you know, it's like I can already, you know, I'm already a master of the bow. I might as well master the spear. Or I might as well master horse riding. I might as well master this, that, you know. Um, but also, um, on a personal level, um, they become very aware, I think, of the, uh, what's the word? The transitory nature of the rest of the universe around mm -hmm. them world things you know they only start to reflect things when they're around as long as they are you know it's like tree men and forests and you know castles that they've built themselves and stuff which is why you know they kind of started to get on with the dwarfs and then they realize even the dwarfs don't live as long as them and they're, they're still kind of temporary mm -hmm. um and, again, and you know again that, in that comparison you know with, with the with the humans it's you know again the dwarfs don't like being the other way around you know they're used to like generationally outliving people and then suddenly this other lot come along where actually the guy that your grandfather talked to to do this deal is the same guy that your son's going to talk to or your daughter. Mm -hmm. or um, so, uh, so, so the elves, you know, like we say, you know, that was then, this is now kind of mentality as well of, of expediency and, you know, well, like you gave your word and it's like, yeah, well, my word was worth that much now, but, you know, uh, and you know, uh, but I think we should reconsider it. And actually, it's better for, for better for me now if I do this. Um, and similarly, everything's slightly again politically as well. You know, this the idea that um, uh, because because alliances just shift and change. And like I say, they if, if the dwarfs are static, then they're very much energetic and movement and things. So. Well, and, and again, so an alliance can last for 300 years. And you're like, oh, that's a long alliance. And it's like, that's a third, if that, of an elf lifetime. It's an alliance of 20 years, maybe, that we would think of it. So actually, the fact that it's like change, you go, actually, the people that signed that alliance are the same ones that are changing their minds now. Mm. <laughs> it's not it's not some ancient treaty. It's like, a, uh, actually, no, I'm just going to, you know, I've changed my mind and I'm going to go over to these people over here. Um, but also, it kind of, but they also have that, it, uh, or at least had, very much that exploring quality, that going out into the world and seeing what was there. And, you know, they're doing it in a very colonial, arrogant way of like, you know, we're just going to, you know, hello, do you have a flag? Um, <laughs> kind of approach. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is all ours. We're going to put citadels here. This is us. Oh, look, there's some, some barbarians around. That's right, that's fine. And some of them have got green skins. We'll just kill those. Oh, look, some short people with beards. Oh, they appear to be able to talk. Um, yeah. So, um, and so, you know, you have to get one of those one of those touchstones for the elves is the <clears> British <throat> Empire, yeah, yeah. Mm. And, and all the good and bad and everything else that comes with that. And this idea, so you have this island in the, you know, that's good, from which everyone spreads everywhere and, and takes over, but then collapses. That's the point. It's, the, it's not just the British Empire; it's the fall of the British Empire and the loss of mm. power, the loss of prestige. The very again, it's a very British archetype that it draws on, and this idea of like, you know. Um, It'll be slightly conf confused, but the idea of beset Albion, but but also I'm beset on all sides now. This island and this siege mentality, which again is funny enough, is quite similar to the dwarfs. They've ended up in a similar place, uh, mm. and, and which persists for thousands of years. In fact, you know, again, the, we have to remember that at the end, um, like the, the Warhammer state that we knew of it for most of the time, was not the, of the elves being in the old world and the you know the after Teclis and founding the Colleges of Magic and after the Great War Against Chaos, which, again, in Elven terms is like, you know, last week. Um, mm. 
is very new um, and wasn't the state of the old world for you know like for centuries for millennia they weren't the elves left after the war of the vengeance slash war of the beard um the elves left they, they, and you know they, and there was pockets of them left behind but that was it really they were, and they were not interested they they bunkered up and they had their own problems and fighting amongst themselves uh, and and essentially the, you know, the British analogy continues, but um, <laughs> but, but, that, but that's the thing. They gave up the empire and and, and let and let it, you know, whatever. Fine, let the barbarians overrun it. It's, we, you know, we've got other issues. It's all about us, you see. Because that's the other thing about the elves is they, you know, they're not they're not big on the empathy for other people. Um, so so yeah, again, uh, but for them, yeah. So I say the the one upmanship and and being you know again as part of that sort of um you know the royal court before the french revolution and the oh such and such you know calador's wearing you know gold this 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 century everyone's going to wear gold now and you know and curry for favor and actually and jostling for position and recognition because again they've uh they essentially live in a post scarcity society on all swan you know it's like literally their plows can plow the fields on their own if they want to and things like that so they have to indulge in this <laughs> is the Elven Ferran? Oh God, no! <laughs> I don't even want. <laughs> I think that, that's the thing. They went. They went the other way, didn't they? The Finny Bar was the anti ferrars I think they they decided to join. Uh, Teclis, you know, they went out. Um, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. we actually, should I don't know? Actually, I'm trying to think. Oh, is there, an, is there an anti character from Bill's Tyrion and You know, like he's like, no, we should be staying here and not. I mean, you know. Well, that was probably, I mean, probably like. like Probably like Calder yeah. the second of his obsession yeah. with like we don't need dwarf <laughs> like they're just little mud hut dwelling. It's true. Yeah, let's just pull everything inwards. Forget it. <laughs> we'll just run them over. Yes, yeah. Well, yes, probably. Or we'll find out Belinar is like, uh, you know, you've got to protect the borders of Orthwan. <laughs> I mean, they literally protect our borders. They literally have these myths and shifting aisles to stop yep. people coming sure. over <laughs> again. You know. Um, which is great. I love that the greatest, the greatest defeats the elves suffered since they did that was led by a goblin. Yeah, um, <laughs> Grom. Grom. Well, Grom is what was one of you know, and he got there by mistake basically. It's, and it's not even an orc, a goblin, a big fat goblin, and he rampaged across the lands. And it's, again, it's a great story. And it's just humorous and stupid, and and actually, it's, 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 it's the whole point is it's the pincushion in the arrogance of the elves. Is that mm -hmm. you know it's, it, it wasn't even like aha you know the the greatest of the orc wars that cost it. It's like no, it was just like a lost goblin and all his mates and he had a shaman on a wyvern. Um, so yeah, I think and that's the thing. There is that pomposity about the elves. Mm -hmm. You know, you have you. The, so again, it might be quite difficult for people who aren't English um, <laughs> to naturally assume that. But for us, you know, I, I'm, you know, we have to work hard not to have it. You know, because well, not so much these days, but again, culturally, for the people that were creating these things, you know, like the English are the best people in the world, and that, and everyone else, uh, foreigners, are you know, obviously clearly inferior. Um, and so the elves are like this. You know, it's just like they were very, you know, even even though their interventions in the old world later. <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. Um, <laughs> you heard that one, Sean. Did it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's <laughs> well, well, she, to be fair she tanked the elven economy not uh he, you know he could tank the elven economy not the uh goblin economy so uh, <laughs> um but uh uh sorry what was i just said uh before pricking uh, from yeah uh, yes pompous elves oh yes yeah, so, but even um so even Teclis is like, you know, ha, oh, you know, we'll come over and help you in the Great War Against Chaos was because it's like, oh, we need Real. to, you'll just stop using all this wild magic and stuff. It's just feeding the gods. Let us teach you a bit about how to do this properly, safely. You can't, mm -hmm. you know, and we, here we go. Look, it's all divided up and you just, you know, stay in your lanes and don't mix all this stuff. Together. High magic, no, don't worry about dark magic. No, don't worry about that. But just, just do the, do the simple, I tell you what, you, We'll worry about the algebra. You just do the arithmetic. Yeah, um, that's, that's so. And, and, that, and that, so again, you know, and you can understand why lots of the humans are just like, really, what? You know, who are you to just come over and tell us this? Um, yeah, that, that's one of the things I've really enjoyed about kind of the expanding uh, lore quite a bit is getting to see like how certain human cultures have been developing their own magic outside of the elves, because so many of the cultures of Warhammer Fantasy have magic taught to them 
by another race where it's like they learned it from the dragons and the empire learned it from the elves and Bretonia also kind of learned it from the elves and then you got like kislev up there who's kind of figured out their own system and it's like really weird um but uh I, yeah i am curious uh <laughs> about sean's question here all right okay so i did i actually mentioned this in white dwarf once and it got people very confused um because it said the empire John. um Obviously, like we've we've made a good you know we've we've made uh, a good show of tell, telling people about the empire and it's like it's raised in forests and navigate by rivers and you know and it's beset by all of these dangers and some of which are the enemy within but actually the two two of the two of the main dangers are essentially the savage foes which was the beastmen who live in the forest and attack who are like the Germanic tribes uh, of the of the Roman Empire they're out there and they keep ambushing us and attacking you and stuff like that and they're 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 the enemy of the deep forest and then you have the enemy of the highlands and the mountains which is the orcs yeah mm. so the, uh, the Scots are the orcs all yeah. right gov <laughs> yeah. boy boy oh well, no, no. Scottish I am <laughs> no no exactly so them so individually they're based basically on you know English football hooligans but within the context of the geopolitical landscape they're they're you know you look at their invasions they're always they, they, again they're not in there they, they're coming from the mountains no no but it's great well that's the thing and, and you're right oh you know actually well that's the thing these days it might be taken literally and they'd be based on like Glaswegian hooligans mm. oh, or something like that you know nice crime the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, the, 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 so they are fond of the old Ed Butt, you know. So there's bits of it still in there. But, you know, again, I think that's something that basically, you know, the skinheads have, like, you know, incorporated anyway. So, but yeah, it's a good example of what Warhammer does well, which is taking this, this kind of, it's like not being very literal on, on across everything. It's like, yeah, actually, they're just these horrible, violent thugs, you know, and stuff. But actually, um, but on, 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 the, on the geographical <laughs> landscape, <laughs> You know, they, they actually they're the, they're the raiding marauders that come down and they sweep in and they do, you know, lots of damage and then they go again. Obviously, they're not the Scots weren't the only people that did that historically, <laughs> but as again, you know, but we did it best. We did it to the English, <laughs> so that's the point. You know, <laughs> totally. It doesn't, you know, um, and 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 again, you don't want to get into it too closely. It breaks down, but on the, on a the larger level, that's kind of how it works. You know, that's. What when people say what's the difference between beastmen and orcs? He's like, well, because there's little ones and bigger ones and even bigger ones, and then you know, and the rest of you go, yeah. But actually, these guys are here, and now that you know, like if we're talking about stories and things, are the things in the woods that come and hunt you, and you don't go into the woods because they're going to eat you, and then you know, and they they surprise, uh, pour over the walls of your village, and you know that's why you just find dead villages here and there and stuff. Whereas orcs, you know, are coming, <laughs> and they're just gonna, you know. Th uh, crash into you like a, a tide and eventually run out of steam Freedom. and retreat. Yeah. And funnily enough, just like just when they're gonna win, they'll just start fighting amongst themselves um Every about time. who's in charge. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then I'm having just to go home. Um yeah, what... so I can't think of anyone like that, but you know. um, I, I wanna pick up on one point as well because um for me the definition of the elves and the dwarves as they are currently presented in Warhammer for me the influence of Gav is not just small, it's enormous. Now, obviously, other writers have done things as well, but for how I've approached them in the various products I've done, his write-ups on them have been particularly influential. And there's one point that he hasn't brought up that I do think is worth bringing up on the elf side, and that is just how over emotional. <laughs> um, which I do think is worth it because he's brought because it's something we've discussed between ourselves as well, just how over emotional elves are in comparison to others, because it really does typify so much of their species. Yes, yeah, and you know we're talking about you know uh, men, mentioned Cal man, well man, <laughs> and mentioned Caldor the second then you know and shaving off the dwarf's beard and uh, uh, was it him or, the, or no it was the first yeah but well, anyway yeah. But, 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 yeah so you know and and that kind of just petulance of of like uh, uh, you know and pettiness so on the one side you have these amazing you know can devote you know days to you know reading or even just reciting a, a poem which you know like lords their ancestors and the lands they came from blah 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 blah, blah. and at the same time it's like Ugh, yeah horrible thing shave off his beard and send it back you know we'll <laughs> teach him a lesson um in the same people that's the thing i think nobody the important thing about warhammer is nobody gets out of it looking great and nobody gets out of it looking terrible yeah. unless you're really terrible um, you know, th there's always this blend, like I said, this reality of people. Like, again, 
all of these cultures are very strange and things, but their mode and the way they act is different. Their motivations tend to be fairly the same, though. They're about you know looking good or not being embarrassed or wanting power, uh, you know, whether that's externally or internally. All these all the drivers that humans recognise that make stories and you know stuff like that are there. But the way they go about it and the way they um, and the way they value those things, judge those successes of those things are different. You know? So again, dwarves have kings, which is really weird because you'd think actually you know, all of them they should be quite democratic. You'd think and all the rest of it. But actually, again, it's just about tradition. It's about mm -hmm. it's about predictability. Mm -hmm. Whereas as, you know, like, as, as we know, democracy actually can be quite unpredictable and stuff like that. So actually, it's like, but the king is actually really first among equals, um, yeah. or the queen. Much more than maybe the the elven kings. Actually, they 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 aspire to become kings. Whereas actually the dwarfs are like, well, I'm I'm not royal, so therefore I'm not going to become king. They don't have that kind of like War of the Roses. Oh, if I chop his head off, because again, kin slaying, big no no. So because again, they had to be because if they if they allowed king slaying, they'd all be dead now because they irritate each other so much. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know that uh, that if they couldn't if if, if it wasn't the worst thing ever then yeah it it had to be the worst thing ever essentially um whereas yeah so again that 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 whereas actually the the elves the kingship and rule is like a bauble to be fought over really, mm -hmm. in many yeah. ways it's like i'm in charge i've got the hat now everyone has to do what i say i've got the king oh oh hang on like i've I'm, I'm, and when we're king, we're going to do what I say. I'm going to do this, and we're going to go adventuring. Okay, cool. Oh no, I've died. All right, my son. Oh, he's a bit of an idiot, and suddenly somebody else <laughs> wants to, um, you know, take over. Oh my! Um, and then they have this really weird thing again, of course, which of course is the real power uh, is actually the Ever Queen. That's the point. Mm. And, and so we have all this emphasis on the line of the kings and doing this and the other and the different ranges of the kings, but the constant power. Which is why that can all go on is the ever queen the actual the, the heart of the elves and, and the magical power and the stability comes from from the ever queen's reign and her being eternal essentially or what was you know sort of like essentially reincarnated into her daughters and whatever else um uh so you know it, all of this kind of male froth of being in charge and stuff like that um makes no difference avalon is still avalon and it's still the kind of like this actually it still has the most spiritual power. That the, the te is a very good divide between yeah. temporal and spiritual power, I suppose. Yeah. Well, it almost gives off the really interesting vibe that that the Phoenix King and a lot of a lot of the timeline is just a bobble. Like he's not really there to. Uh... Uh, Andy, you're muted. <laughs> you muted yourself. I was just saying. I was just responding to a question there. <laughs> yeah. One. Yeah. One. One time thing. Yes. Uh, though we. Yeah. Hopefully we'll have to get back. That would be super exciting. But yes, it's, it's a special guest. <laughs> But uh, as much as we'd love to have him, <laughs> so I could torment him every week with questions. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah. um, uh, it's it's it, that is one of the things that's really interesting to me is that the Fingers Kings really do come off like bobbles, and that a lot of them cause more problems than they solve, almost universally, with very rare exceptions. Where like Halidor the First is considered so awesome because he spent his entire life mostly cleaning up the uh, the the Sundering. Um, but even then, it's like he was given that problem as opposed to like it was something he solved during his tenure. Uh, whereas like the vast majority of them, like um, uh, uh, pretty much a lot of them that came after an Arian uh, had more issues than <laughs> anything else because they would start wars or have political schisms. And like it was so rare to have a Phoenix King who was yeah doing other stuff, which is it's it's so, and, but then you have yes. the other King who is far more stable. Um, far more consistent because it's something like they had before an Aryan. It's not a pride thing. It's just a this is an aspect yeah. that's always been here kind of thing. Yeah, it, yeah, definitely that. Um, and the thing, and and then you weigh that to expand it out slightly. You know, again, you have the Phoenix Kings and their agendas and the politics and the ability to do their thing, and actually they're weighed against this again on a larger scale. Again, a Sparta Athens kind of divide of. The dark elves of the Nagarothi, who are ruled by an iron fist of Malekith and Marathi, mm. like the dictator, the like the they are the undying king and the queen mm. king's mother, whatever you know title she wants. Um, which is why the Hyles fail so often, because actually, again, the, the, they they've run into something again which outlasts them. 
you know, a reign of a king can be a thousand years, but the reign of, you know, Malekith has been 7,000 years, you know. Mm. Um, and so he can play the long game uh, again and again and again. And so they, they you know, they, they have expeditions, they have failures, they, you know, the back and forth of it all. Um, and the, for, for the part of the high elves, yes, they, they, they sometimes have expansionist kind of like um, uh, king and, and an outlook and other times they're very isolationist and introvert. Uh, and, and sometimes it's about getting their own back on the dark elf. Sometimes it's about protecting themselves against the dark elf because that's the other thing. They then allow the dark elf to start essentially dictating their culture and their agenda, which is why, you know, uh, once they withdraw, and they become this island, this besieged island nation, basically. And they, although they try to, you know, they've got these little fortresses, you know, to help essentially. Because sorry, because the, the other thing again about the British Empire stuff is, is there? You have to remember, like the um, Ulthuan, the Isles are a naval power. Mm-hmm. That was the other thing. They can, for for the longest time, they controlled the oceans and the sea. That's the other parallel, basically, um, which is why you know they've got they've got. Um, fortresses down at the Cape of Good Hope and then the other one. Um, so, so that you know, it, it used to be that you, nothing could happen in the world without the High Elves, you know, knowing about it and getting there and whatever. Mm. Else. And again, that's diminished. Their, their reach has genuine has been diminished over time. Um, and so, and then so the the Dark Elves are the reflection of that again. They have this worldwide range for their black arcs and their fleets to strike at will to do what they were. They're, you know, they are the bad end side of that as well. Um, and so you have this these two competing you know navies that again kind of deplete each other over the millennia and, and you know essentially withering you know the, the, the locked in the that kind of like death throttles of each other basically while the rest of the world catches up and carries on and does its own thing um which again is a nice cool backdrop story it's a big history stuff to, to kind of set your, your it has context your character when you're writing your characters when you're developing contours particularly again elves who like you know may have lived through the reign of two different kings or three different kings depending on when you set it and all the rest of it um whose grandfather fought at the battle of such and such you know um, like i said they're not quite immortal but it is it is reminiscent of the cool bit you know lord of the rings when you're like Hey, look, there's Elrond at the you know the last the last mm, lines yeah. of men and elves, and he's the guy running the council because he's just like and because it, he's got that continuity. So it's the same it's the same deal, and you have to just remember, you know, uh, that those gener- that generational change happens so slowly, if at all. But actually, because well, it, or it should do, but actually because the elves are so kind of flighty and emotional and stuff, it can actually the swing with the change of a, a change of a season. That's the thing, um, and suddenly they're they're you know they're into something else, or they want you know either individually or as a culture, or just or somewhere in between. Um, so that's yeah, so that's where you are with with elves. Okay, that's that answer. I, it was, it's a good one. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm particularly amused on the teenage front because um, I obviously have my memories of being a teenager, and I'm <laughs> quite certain that I was a very balanced one because, of course, I was. Sure, sure. Um, but there's nothing quite having gone through the job. So how many thousands of points of by 18? And let's just not discuss that <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, um, my Nargle army was strangely the biggest, and it was also my least favourite. I've no idea what. Oh no, I do. It was easy to paint. Um, but that all aside, um, I was uh, very bemused um, as my kids moved into their teenage years, and then my oldest now is off at university, um, and seeing the uh, what, what what was real flightiness, where one day it was one thing, the next day the same person exactly the same attitudes, wanting exactly the same things, but a different thing. And that, for me, was deeply influential into how I was considering, uh, at that point, writing my elves, because I was obviously writing some as well at that point, because it's extraordinarily how quick someone who seems utterly consistent can be so very inconsistent. And that was just marvellous, because it's a, a great source of inspiration when you're creating these things. Yeah, and the teenager thing is about what you value you know because mm-hmm. because the real you know because because essentially teenagers have their own value system and it and it exists within very small groups of teenagers potentially and it matters as well. so much and it matters yeah. so much yeah exactly the right band the right clothes and it doesn't have to be the mainstream one in fact actually you know for a lot of people it Open isn't uh, and that creation of an identity and i always mm-hmm. find that fascinating for elder for elves of like this idea of end if you're living for thousands of years and the idea of your, who you are and your identity as the world changes in your place in it like say the dwarves refuse to change mm-hmm. 
And whereas the elves perhaps are too malleable in being, you know, influenced and, and changing themselves and who they are in that way, because they still want to be fashionable, they still want to be liked, they still want to have influence, they still want to look relevant, um, and and all of those other things that you do as a teenager. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which hey, uh, quiffs are in. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually do like that very very much. Of uh, I think a lot of people when they see Warhammer elves are going to kind of default to the idea of like, oh, they're so long lived that they must be like extremely consistent or they view the passing of the world as it's an eye blink to them. So they would never oh. change when in reality, they're probably changing very, very often because they, you know, their uh, passions are switching on a regular basis or they get bored of something relatively quickly because they're like, well, I've already mastered that or I already understand that to its fullest and it has no interest or fun for me anymore. So I'm going to move over to the other thing. But uh, hey, yeah. man, question here uh, for Gav. What did your work on? Uh, what did you work on in For Honor? And what is your favorite part of that game's lore from Hammond? Okay, so yeah, so this is outside of Warhammer. Um, so I worked on a video game called For Honor, which is basically a sword fighting video game. I okay. worked on the central. I worked on the central premise of it basically, which was it was great. So the creative director, lovely, amazing guy called Jason Van Der Berg, um, was working on this game. He worked for Ubisoft Montreal. Um, and he's a huge Warhammer fan and the rest of it. Um, and, and he had this idea for a game and he's really into swords and things. So he wanted to basically make a sword version of first person shooters. Like, uh, you know, the first person shooters are always like these days, you, you know, you can pick one up and you know what all the buttons do. It doesn't matter because whatever, they're all kind of the same. Yeah. Right. But right trigger fire. Blah, blah. So he wanted to do the same thing for swords games, which wasn't like a normal fighting game it was a proper sword fighting game. And he did an amazing job. I loved the game he designed um but as a uh so but the theme for it was essentially um pitting the three greatest kind of like weapon wielders or three cool different weapon wielders each other so it's basically samurai versus knight versus viking versus samurai you know so these were the three warrior archetypes they wanted to have in the game so essentially uh that was so they phoned me up um it was really sweet because he said he was uh he he was chatting to uh, the, the like the design team or his, his, the, and um, one of the other things they wanted to do is they wanted to do a, a kind of a narrative camp have a kind of permanent narrative campaign, um, much like we did with Storm of Chaos, but only a bit longer, you know. So this kind of stuff. So and and he had said. Um, Oh, well, we need someone like Gav Thorpe to do it. And then his game director said, we're Ubisoft. We can probably get Gav Thorpe. Um, <laughs> uh, and he's right, like, we could probably manage that. Yeah. Uh, he's like, okay. So they got contact through LinkedIn. Or one of the few jobs I actually got through LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, I'm not saying he explained this to me. He's just like, basically, I just need someone who could come up with a way that we can have samurai fight, fighting Vikings, fighting knights. Um, could you do that for me? So that's what I did. I came up with the, the, and again, a lot of it was just off screen and a lot of it changed. There was a bit of a narrative and I introduced this really cool kind of like really baddie character to give it more focus on, but the world building, I basically did the world building to make that possible. So um, the the premise was there's, there was, um, it wasn't even a hit, I think, but there's a near miss asteroid collision round about the 11th century. And, uh, and basically, the idea was it kind of uh, Europe carried on evolving, but very slowly. The Vikings were obviously replaced by the Normans, and then they were isolated and continued Vikingy. And so then, so and actually, the Vi they didn't go full on on my vision, unfortunately. But the idea was that the Vikings actually thought Ragnarok had happened, and that they were now, and then, and that they thought Europe was Valhalla. So when they get, so they raided back across. And they literally thought they were dead, so they didn't care. And they were very orky. They were just like very just joyous of battle. Like, we're in Valhalla, great. Let's have a big fight. And didn't you know? It's like, oh, he's not really dead. He's just you know, because uh, this is Valhalla. Um, and, and at the same time, obviously, because this all happened on a much slower pace, because uh, you know, uh, there's like you know, uh, 500 years of kind of essentially close to nuclear winter, and civilization goes slowly. So that all of this has time to catch up uh, in the Far East, but eventually. Essentially, samurai developing the Far East, uh, and then there was uh, something basically kind of like uh, an aftershock of this. Eventually, kind of sets off the Ring of Fire, and there's lots of volcanic activity. And essentially, they, the samurai have to abandon Japan, or a bunch of them do, and they head west, essentially. And so they right. come west, 
the, the Europe's in the middle, and the Vikings are coming from from the west, going east, and then so that was and it, you know, a it big was paper, Viking paper, Europe, big yeah, Viking. And, then, and then you get to find out who's better, a knight, a samurai, or a Viking. So that's what I came up with, basically. And then lots of the and lots and lots of just like teaching them about like Viking culture and samurai culture and the ref and, and I created that world bible for them basically. Um, but I, I, it went really far. It was a really good example actually of you know talking about Warhammer background and influences and stuff because I, I had a bit in the Vikings originally which was like the Vikings identified with different parts of Norse culture. So some of them thought they were elves or some of them thought they were dwarves. And it was like, oh no, we mm. don't really want any fantasy stuff. It's like no, 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 this is not fantasy, this it's is not, not fantasy. beliefs. And, and it's like, oh, yeah, I forgot that came from somewhere. And you're like, so that didn't go in, because, again, you know, layman playing this, just like, am I playing a fantasy game now? And you're like, um, so. <clears throat> so, so um, Hammer does a very so, quick follow-up. Would you borrow anything that you wrote for that for Warhammer? Would you import anything? Um, I, still, I certainly learned a lot about those particular cultures that I was reading into. Actually, a lot more about knights and uh, and and uh, and particularly like uh, it's more kind of twelfth to fourteenth century, I would say. Can't remember if gunpowder was coming in or not in the game, um, but um, so uh, and again, reading much more in depth about samurai and samurai society and stuff than I'd done per se before, and learning a lot about Vikings, which was really fun. Uh, and essentially. Um, uh, I remember at the time they had these badges of like promotion, which was like, you know, are you a knight? Are you a samurai? Are you a Viking? And I was just like, no, I'm definitely Viking. <laughs> I'm just going to fight. <laughs> when this game comes out, I didn't actually get to play it that much when it came out, unfortunately, because I was very busy. Um, with it having it sucks, fun. doesn't it? Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, uh, uh, so I would say there's lots of elements, particularly, um, I would say, uh, just in terms of seeing how different warrior cultures work and the similarities between them and the differences they have and stuff has helped in terms of like looking at space marines for example or looking at other very warrior cultures like the dark elves and things that have very militaristic cultures mm. um, i would say but uh, so it was it wasn't like the game itself necessarily or that but the work that i did for it the research so um fed into and continued my my Again, take reading outside of the fiction, reading history, reading real world stuff. I find generally more inspiring than reading other people's made up stuff. Mm. These yeah. days. I've yeah. read lots of fiction, I've read lots of great fiction, lots of not so great fiction, but actually, you know, I'll read something about a particular battle and go, oh, that's really cool. And again, the idea isn't to take that one thing and just go, okay, yeah, and here's a Warhammer battle on a frozen lake. It's like, well, yeah, that's obviously you know this particular battle just with Orcs versus the Empire. But you take an element from it and you blend it with something else, and there's something else. So you go, well, you know. Um, but occasionally you can just have nods to stuff as well. You know, you don't, you don't have to be ashamed of your inspirations. I don't think mm. you just call it, you just call it an homage and get away with it. You know, oh, it's an homage. <laughs> yeah. You know. <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah, if you're ready, I'm gonna actually jump us into some questions from the community, just because we're getting a little low yeah. on time here, and we're we just are looking at time already. Gosh, we're just gonna get through yeah. as many of them as we can. Okay, uh, okay, quick fire round. Oh, quick right, fire so, round. Uh, Grummerdal asks, uh, as far as uh, what was your thought process on describing the dwarf architecture from different holds, like comparing Ekron before its fall to like a traditional dwarf hold? Oh, uh, well, Ekron's a really weird one because it's a little bit of an offshoot place, anyway. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, so you know it's a little bit isolated and and it's like a second generation hold already mm. i would say so actually the old the big holds um uh have evolved far beyond being a mine whereas i think ekron's still kind of like a lived in mine for a lot of it and a lot, you know, some of it's civilized but a lot of it's still just big mine workings and they haven't really fancied it up and stuff like that so i think that's when you when you're looking at dwarf architecture and their environments um the thing you look at is one is how how far down and how old it is so obviously the longer they spent in it the more it's refined and the more they've kind of like turned it into their their, their space um uh but also i think you you then start you think about well who are their local ancestor gods who are their local you know like um, the equivalent of that you know um the families that lived there and stuff like that so Again, you might you might want to 
have those influenced in different ways in terms of the the style of the decoration you have or the style of the architecture but yeah i mean the whole thing about the dwarfs is that again they're very traditional they don't nearly change a lot mm -hmm. um so it's more a case of the longer they're in a place the more refined it will get uh and, and again they don't really necessarily want to reinvent stuff so if stuff gets broken because goblins have come in or the tunnels collapse or whatever they'll try and remake it like it was Mm. Um, they won't go with the flow and go oh yeah cool you know it's just a little happy mistake we'll just do you know, yeah, <laughs> there are no happy mistakes they, 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 no. <laughs> it's just like no okay right we're gonna dig <laughs> dig that all out again and get the columns up again and blooming hell it's like me it's playing like... minecraft <laughs> I'm, I'm super obsessed with minecraft i build every nice long straight tunnels all beautiful down the side as Lindsay's mining away like mad just having fun and i'm like no oh, build 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 <laughs> And if it blows yes. up, I will remake it exactly the way it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that. Yeah. Uh, see, uh, uh, prob from... probably slightly inferior. That's the problem again because they haven't had quite as long, and it's a bit of a rush job. And then, and mm. you know, we had to leave it and go and fight some goblins as well. Mm. So actually, it's not quite as good as it was. And it's like, uh, and we'll get back to it. We're back. We're back next Monday, mate. All right, and mm. then come back to it because another thing's broken. It's in decline is the thing to remember. Decline is an important word. Uh, see, another question he has is, what uh, what is your favorite thing to write about when it comes to the dwarfs or the Karazhan core? All of it. I mean, I just... <laughs> it's it's great, it? <laughs> I think so. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff I still like to, to write about that I didn't really get a chance to do. Um, a couple of uh, contributions that Pete Haynes made, actually, about Reckoners. Uh, which were a really cool idea, and 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 wearing like grudge stones and stuff like that. So mm. there was a few. I, um, so there was there. Were, I, I thought one of the things I'd like to do is write a story where where we followed the, a reckoner who could move around a lot. Because yeah. you, you know, um, for all that it was like we managed to get him around a bit. Essentially, grudge bearer is is uh, quite local and and lots of the interaction. It was a very dwarfy novel on purpose, so interacting with a lot of other dwarfs and things. And they go and fight other people, because it's like the dwarf grudge and the orc, sorry, the orc grudge and stuff. But actually a reckoner could go and write lots of different places. And, and, yeah. and me, me, me and Andy actually had a pretty in-depth conversation about dwarf reckoners of we did. relating to something. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that would be fun. I'd like to do that. Yeah, for anyone for anyone out there that's like, I would love to create like a complex character for a wolf rip campaign that I can play. Dwarf <laughs> reckoner is like that is like way up there on a really really good character uh so just kind of skipping around uh argonok asked a question of oh so for your version of marathi uh did you consider her to secretly be a cultist or follower of slanesh or did you prefer the version of her where she was not associated with slanesh oh no she's always been corrupted by slanesh she was captured by a slaneshy warband mm -hmm. and the corruption was in there and then and she's you know, that's it. I mean, I, the fact that the debate is is it fascinating. But it's like yeah. that's well, she, she was she's unintentionally at first because the elves aren't corrupted intentionally themselves, and and they're not like chaos elves. The dark elves are not chaos elves in that sense. Whereas of course Marathi and the uh, and the cult of Snesh have moved that way, but they are. Mm. The, uh, it's funny enough because. Um, uh, for the for the thumbnail here, actually you used I can't remember what it ended up with the uh, Kane, Kane the Kane yeah. novel, yeah, and and uh, and, and the pre the preface of that is that basically how how chaos chaos actually won their victory when the elves fell you know fell out with each other over the crowning of Malachis because mm. of Marathi, yeah, because Mar they didn't wasn't well, they didn't trust Marath Malachis because they didn't trust Marathi, yeah, mm. as the mother, and that's why they refused to crown Malachis as Phoenix King, and then it all goes bad after that basically. Um, uh, as a hint, there's a kind of like that. I always imagined again, not like literally first person, but I always imagined that was narrated by Bellacor. That was him. Bellacor, Bellacor. Yeah, exactly. So his brother. So, so that's 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 the central conceit for me. It's like Marathi is corrupt, but Malachith is not. That's the that's where we have to end up with the arc that it ended up, mm. with, which wasn't necessarily around. We didn't have the ending bit, but it was always again the the whole point of Malachith. Uh, it was Malachith. Uh, and a doubt that cost him. It wasn't that the flames rejected him, so he left too early. The flames were supposed to kill him and re it's supposed to be a rebirth. Yeah, like his father. And he didn't have the balls basically to go through with it. Um, mm. Like, like you know, um, like he was supposed to, really. So mm. he, he got the got the destroyed bit, but didn't get the reborn bit, and 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 so dropped out early. So he should have been Phoenix King, um, mm. or could have been, 
but but was that weakness inherent in him and therefore he wouldn't should have been Phoenix? Again, there is no definitive answer. But yeah, Marathi, I'm just like, yeah, of course, yeah, she's yeah. So uh really good question here from <laughs> CB4N, which we deeply appreciated your prior super chat as well, CB4N. The comment was hilarious. But uh given the incompatibility of their culture, do you have any thoughts about how Malekith and King Snorri became such good friends, considering both are kind of paragons mm -hmm. of their race in some ways? Uh, I think uh, the way I wrote it and what I, I would have loved to have written more about them, but it, it's kind of a little... Yeah, they, they deserve like a full... <laughs> they do, but, but also if you go into it too much, then it will lose yeah, the power true. of it, if you see what I mean. And the, and the fact that he outlives Snorri, again, talking about the thing, and it's one of the few deaths that genuinely affects him. Because mm -hmm. um, they are... Uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we wanted to build it up as a thing that was... was significant the fact actually there the could have been phoenix king and the king of the dwarves did get on so well mm -hmm. individually maybe maybe could have been the it's a uh you know um look at what you could have won kind of moment but the point is cor already corrupted chaos broke the world can't win it's too late right. mm -hmm. so but actually so that's the thing is i think they just they both respect they don't both actually just respect each other irrespective i think they both meet in circumstances which allow them to see each other as individuals and although malachis is already slightly conniving and corrupt by this point um actually i think uh snorri is such a it, it, the 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 bits of snorri and dwarven culture that aren't elven are the bits that that malachis draws on i think he's inspired by that by the solidity of him by the trust that he has these people have in him and he's and, and meanwhile snorri sees the potential in malekith and malekith is just this amazingly charismatic leader it's very passionate and and everything else and so they are the odd couple but they do work and they have and they develop this respect over hundreds of years of campaigning together and um and uh, yeah i mean that was one of the most affecting scenes he's a uh, malekith's ride to to be with Snorri before he dies and, mm. and just take, taking horses off and basically riding the length of the world's edge mountains and being there at the, so he could be there and fearing that he's too late because again it's a it's at a stage where you know Malik is not I mean he's not really lost anyone important ever you know he was mm. too young really to appreciate his father's death and, and everything else and he, you know it's like they've been in battle and he's probably seen you know hundreds of elves killed against the force of chaos and all kinds of other stuff but actually somebody dying of old age even a dwarf dying of old age and a friend was yeah you know it's one of the things that for a while tempers him as well you know he's like oh maybe i could be a good king but of course you know, it doesn't yeah that. good old shenanigans shenanigans um, shenanigans shenanigans yeah <laughs> Uh, so skipping ahead to another question from Cryo Tear of could you give some background to when you were writing for the Mark of Chaos game? Uh, it's such an interesting setting yes. for a game, uh, and it still holds up. Uh, I have he says I still have friends who name all of their characters after Stefan von Kessel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so Mark of Chaos. So again, yeah, video game. Uh, we came up with uh, uh, today. Uh, approached me to sort of like come up with a story for the campaign and we had this great big i i love right apart from when i'm not writing about dwarfs i really like stories about the fall to chaos and and, and chaos, chaos is warhammer is chaos yeah. mm. so so again and demon princes and stuff like that so you know the, the, a small kind of like macrocosm of like the great war against chaos or that idea um where we got to see this um uh, and we came up with all of this great story and background and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, as the game was developed, like the escape to tell it just went, doo, 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 oh, hang on. No, oh, well, that's not going to be a cutscene. We're going to have to, to the point that we didn't even have any cutscenes in the game. I don't think all the cinematics were spent on the trailer. Um, mm -hmm. but, there, but then, but then Ant Reynolds wrote the novel tie in. So the real story, as it were, the full story is what Ant writes in the novel. Because I sat down with him in the pub and went through it all. Basically, he said, <laughs> and you have to have a really cool bit where basically, you know, there's a demon prince ripping open a dragon and blah, 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 and all the scenes that have been envisaged would happen. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it was just, um, and it was just fun to tell another Warhammer story. And at that time, in theory, there was a different, it was a different medium. It was like going to be through these scenes and stuff. And it, like I say, unfortunately, uh, as sometimes happens with video games, you know, levels get cut and scenes get cut and things, and you have to hastily like, like paint over the the cracks. Um, and quite a lot of that happened. But yeah, I mean, it was a, uh, 
it was one of my first experiences of writing for video games. So it was always very useful. The fact that it went was went through that process kind of set mm. me up for if it had been uh, you know if it had been amazingly like uh, uh, funded all the way through and nothing would get cut out stuff would have been such a uh, an outlier of the experience of writing for video games. <laughs> it would have, it would have confused me later on. So the fact that you know I went through that harsh process straight away with the first one I worked on was probably quite useful. Yeah, we'll say fantastic game for anyone that wants to play it. It's it's on GOG these days, and you can still play it. It's super fun. It's, yeah, it's a, a little one. it's a little brutal, but uh, but it's very very fun. It holds up really well. It takes place right after the Great War against Chaos. It's and yeah. it's still uh, at least as far as the most recent like up to the end times it was considered canon because Stefan von Kessel appears in some of the army books timelines it's it's a really really fun series of books i referenced it directly in fantasy roleplay 4 as well indeed um, the changes that that game made to talapine got and talabic land and their surrounding area got ported over um so the dunkel coast was mentioned and the various mm -hmm. other locations that were added all included too because hey it's there as well to pull it all together <laughs> so yeah good, good yeah. time yeah uh so um let's see uh I was trying to skip around for like more lore specific questions of uh so uh we have a question here from oh okay interesting question from scythe pedals um in your view are there any differences and if so what are they between the fantasy version of kane and the 40k version of kane oh uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is. There are. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I guess it's perfect. The the the, the 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 there's a slight there's a very different relationship with the elven gods as there is to the Eldar gods, even though they draw from the same source, uh, and they both have the same idea of you know our gods are in in forty k sorry the old the Eldar gods are dead. Mm. Um, in Warhammer, like that's yeah, you know, weird, weird still around and stuff, the, yeah. the yeah. still, so they're not dead, but there's mm. a but they're not so, but they're not as involved as they used to be, is the idea, I suppose. Um, so and Kane again, uh, you know, going off track slightly, but the, again, the in, the elder the aspect warriors in 40k and the path of the warrior and the the exiles and stuff like that are seen as a necessary evil. Mm. Uh, the, the cane and that warlike tendency, the embodiment of the warlike tendency. So, whereas obviously in the elven version of that, right. <laughs> 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 you can call them whatever you like. <laughs> um, uh, the you know, cane is the source of that, as opposed to, a, a, you know, so supposedly cane has kind of like. Um, polluted the souls of the elder a little bit with that murder mm -hmm. rather being the embodiment of it so i think the relationships kind of reverse slightly between the elder and the gods and the elves and the gods so yeah um but, but Cain, as far as again if you get back if you get to the real metaphysics of it and i've talked before about you know like what the gods of the warp being these little swirly things in realm of chaos or in the warp and stuff like that it's like Cain is essentially a little intersection between slanesh and corn where they've kind of turned into this little elder god thing but whether that's true in the elven thing, I'm not so sure because it kind of predates. Does Kane predate like Slash and the coming and the collapse of the gates and stuff? Who knows? Um, okay, so we have a follow up question from Hammond just to <laughs> dig even further into this, which is what would you say the differences or similarities are between the human version of Kane and the elf version of Kane in Warhammer Fantasy? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think probably like the human version of Kane is probably something. Yeah. You know, again, thinking about how it came about and stuff is probably like, you know, they uh, a, a human adaptation of something they kind of learned mm -hmm. from the elves or heard from, and this god of murder and stuff like that. So and they've humanized it and turned it into a human god. In the same way that, again, you've got to remember the inspiration for the elves and a lot of this time is like classical era civilizations like the mm -hmm. uh, Phoenicians and the uh, uh, Greeks and Romans and stuff like that. And they used to borrow each other's gods and learn about their gods and give them different names and stuff like that. So, and, and the old world's the same, really. You know, it's like, you know, well, it's, uh, you know, it's all about little nuances and stuff. So Cain is a more obvious one, but actually, because for some reason it's got the same name, um, but it's just like, yeah, maybe someone somewhere, the idea of Cain um, kind of spread, really. 
from 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 an elven influence, and, but it was basically adopted by humans and turned into a human god. And whether that had an effect, whether again, whether metaphysically there is actually a different manifest manifestation of a human Cain in the realm of chaos, possibly. I mean, I yeah, I wouldn't know that one. I'm not, okay. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna come off the fence whether that's true or not. <laughs> And I think we've got time for one more question before we get yep. in here. Um, so, uh, and this one works fine from uh, Jiggy, which is, is there any factions in Warhammer Fantasy or storylines in Warhammer Fantasy that you wish you could have gotten to work on or tell that you didn't get to? Um, no, not really. I mean, between like novels and, you know, actually working on Warhammer, uh, you know, particularly with Warhammer Lawmaster, I didn't necessarily write lots of the books but i was involved with the writers you know so you know working with Anne and jake and various other people it's like I've, I've been able to dip my fingers in most of the pies at some point and be involved with them you know uh, and see them you know go on and, and do more stuff like you know working with Anne on the Bretonians and then Anne wrote some great Bretonian novels and things like that nice. so so for me <laughs> um uh so yeah i these days are much more about kind of finding interesting characters and, and and using them to explore themes in Warhammer and stuff like that, uh, whether that's 40k or Age of Sigmar or if we get to do you know any um, old world stuff we'll have to see. Um, and uh, I, I would like to do more dwarfs, more proper Warhammer dwarfs. I only actually got to do two novels about dwarfs, and I did more than three about elves, and that's just not right. Yeah, I I really hope they they call on you to do like hiking Aurixen for the old world. That would be, that would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Um, I, I'm going to end with a little um one to just finish on that particular question as well. Um, when uh, I first was talking to Gav about working on something for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, there wasn't reluctance. That would be he was quite excited and was something. <laughs> on. But there was definitely a is there anything that I can actually add and do that's going to really excite me and get me going? Because I, when you reach a certain point and you've done it all, you've told a lot of the stories. There's other things we can do. Um, and for me. Um, sitting down with them and creating a story that was proper epic. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was. It was. It was really a culmination of so many points of the uh, lore that he himself had worked on and built up over various generations. Um, and that, for me, out of everything, was the one that is my probably my biggest regret. Um, out of everything I've missed out on in my various years, I will that say, one's I really... probably my biggest one. After so you don't spoil everybody, but after you run through it on Lawhammer, I really hope like on the Patreon or wherever you just put up like a bullet point list of the general <laughs> timeline <laughs> or guide to what y'all were kind of thinking. I'm, I'm I'm hoping to play it. Assuming that uh, uh, once we finish the enemy within, we're still going. We'll definitely do that because it was just too much fun. Too I, would, much there. I would love to see it. I'm sure a lot of people would like to take their own whack at trying to play through it. And sorry, thanks, thank sir. You for the nice message. Super appreciated. Thank you but very yeah. much. Uh, we're out of time, unfortunately, as uh, much as I would love to keep going. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, Gab, thanks so much for coming on. This has been a really, really big honor. I mean, I You're welcome. I literally grew up with your books. They've meant a lot to me. Thank you for reading. Thank everybody for, for gaming and reading. And, I'm going to uh, give a quick moment. round of applause to Gab because he's just yeah, so awesome. I, and, uh, thank you very much. Uh, very much. Like, like the term later, I will be back, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm very excited here. I will say very quick random plug. I'm not being paid to this, just saying it. I am so fucking excited for Realms of Ruin because Gav <laughs> wrote the lore for Realms of Ruin and I played a little bit of it and it's looking really, really good so far. Um, yeah, I am yeah. super excited uh, to see what you've done in that. That was a cool one. Yeah, again, that was a great project. We'll talk about that. We could do a Realms of Ruin special if you want. Uh, yeah, I'm down. Great. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> okay. Tomorrow, I'm down. <laughs> yeah, cool. All right, then. Well, Thank you very much, and uh, we'll talk soon. Yep. Don't you all get to? Bye. Bye.